first of all, has to do with the usage of commas. It can be an impulse to just throw a comma in there, but commas don't always work. So, in this case, first example involves a compound verb that both have the same subject. Right? He traveled through China and visited the Great Wall. Whoever he is, is both traveling to China and visiting the Great Wall. This case, no comp. And so if your subject is doing the action of both verbs, don't need a comp. If, however, he, went, he traveled to China and she went to India, comp. If you have two clauses that could each stand alone, he traveled to China and stand alone as a sentence. She went to India and can stand alone as a sentence. You combine it, combine it with and, comma. Don't, comma splice. I don't know if you ever heard that term, comma splice. And comma splice is sticking a comma between two, uh, two uh, independent clauses. So he traveled to China, she went to India. Don't use a comma. If you write a sentence like this, this should actually be a semicolon. But it's a lot easier to be traveled to China, period. She went to China. No, she went to Andy. Right. So pay attention to those comma rules. The, the comma is uh, one that comes problematic for a lot of people. Avoid run on sentences. That's where you're just kind of throwing together a bunch of information. It's better to use shorter sentences than longer sentences. But this is something that comes up quite frequently. So here's an example of a run-on sentence. John 7:53 through 811 is a passage that is missing, missing in some some manuscripts of the New Testament. Sometimes it is in a different place. You actually have two separate sentences here. So make them two separate sentences. So watch out for those aspects of your paper where you're throwing a lot of things into one sentence. Think about it. Well, oh, maybe maybe there should be two sentences. And so on the one hand, you have the problem of throwing a bunch of material in, in one spot. The other danger that sometimes happens is that you don't actually have a full sentence. All right. This passage tells us much about Jesus' character. Right. Sentence, how he cares for people. Not a sentence. Right. So watch out for those, because they show up frequently in papers. Again, you're reading through this, you think, okay, looks good to me. Give it some time, come back. Right. This is in a sentence. Right. It doesn't really have a subject, it doesn't really have a verb, it's just kind of a statement, just kind of hanging it out there by itself. It is a fragment of a sentence. In those cases, it's either you should do either two things. One is to combine it with the previous sentence. <coughs> this passage tells us much about Jesus' character and how he cares for people, or make it into two complete sentences. Right? This passage tells us much about Jesus' character, particularly it shows how much he cared for people. So watch out for those things in your paper where you have just a part of a sentence instead of an entire sentence. There are some words that are problematic for people at the time. And again, you probably know the difference between each of these three words. There, there, and there. But because they all sound the same, when you're writing, it might come out, right? what's this one? What does this mean? They all, right? which is quite different than this first one, which is a possessive of a group of people, right? This is their house, right? So it's a house that belongs to a group of people, right? There, of course, is a demonstrative pronoun that means it's there, right? So you know, well, possessive, demonstrative pronoun, right? contraction. But, I promise you I do it myself. Sometimes I'll write this when I mean this. 
Now, your word processing program, if it's set up for a grammar check or spell checker, might catch this. Right? Sometimes it might not. So, you can't just rely on the machine thinking for you. You've got to have to look at it as well. So, know the difference between those three. This is one that gets a lot of people. The difference between loose and lose. I frequently see papers where what they mean is this one, but they have written this one. So, you mean to lose something, all right? We're going to lose this game. And, I, and I'll get, we're going to lose this game. What does we're going to lose this game mean? All right? So, again, you're thinking this one, but you end up typing this one, and it may or may not be caught. So, pay attention to those kinds of things. You and your, the same kind of thing. One's possessive, one is contraction. The difference between then and then. Then is sequential. Right? If, this, if this happens, then we are going to. Then is comparative, greater than something else. Right? So then and then. Again, depending on your accent, they might both sound the same if you would say them, but they mean something different. So you know, keep, uh, keep that in mind. Remember, then is sequential. Than is comparative. Also problematic for a lot of people is the difference between these two words, both of which are pronounced it. One is the contraction, it is. And the other is the possessive. Now this one again, it may be caught by your spell checker, it may not. And ultimately, it's up to you to make sure that if you mean this one, you've written this one. If you mean this one, and this is the problem with this, of course, is that when you make a, when you make a possessive for a lot of words, is apostrophe s. But that's, I mean, in general, though, you should try to avoid contractions if possible. So if you mean to say it is, you should type out it is. They do not know whether this passage belongs to the gospel, instead of they don't know. Also pay attention to, and this is another one that shows up quite frequently, is that plurals are not made by an apostrophe S. Okay, so if you're wanting to talk about a plural word, you want to make sure that you don't use an apostrophe S. And so, especially if you're talking about what, what really becomes problems if you're trying to do plurals of, of proper names, right? the Brennemans, right? not the Brennemans, right? this is possessive. Right? Todd Brennemans' class is tragically boring at 8.30 in the morning. Right? Possessive. <coughs> but if you want to say um, the Brennemans, however, are wonderful people, right? this is how you would do it. Now, some of them, of course, can be thrown off, right? Uh, we have uh, Mr. Myers, he's a professor here. If I were to want to talk about his family, it's the Myerses, not the Myers, possibly as, or just the Myers. Right? So, keep that in mind. Not really something that shows up too often, but that apostrophe S throws people off, where you try to make it plural, and then plural through an apostrophe S. A lot, not a lot, even though you might say it, but in general, a lot of the time, you should avoid it. Find a, a lot is one of those vague words. See if you can find another word or phrase that you can use to replace it. But if you are going to use it, it is a lot, not a lot. Know the difference between two, two, and two. This is one that your grammar checker might not get right. Because if I want to say, I have too much work to do, which, which one of these should I use? The T-O-O. But 
if I want to say this passage is important to much of the people, which one am I going to use? The first one, right? Yeah. But your grammar checker might, because you have to in front of much, try to encourage you to use this one because of the phrase too much. Right? So this is one where your grammar checker might throw you off. So know the difference between when you use those three. This one, and this one of course, is obvious, right? When I'm going to write two, but again, sometimes it sounds in your head properly and you might write the wrong thing. It is would have and could have, not would have or could have. Again, depending on your accent and how you say it, you might say, I would have taken this course, but I decided to take something else. Right. Well, when you're writing it is would have, right? not would of. Again, it's the difference between what sounds in your head as you're typing and what is proper English. Know the difference between affect and effect. Affect is a verb. This paper is going to affect your grade. Effect is now the effect of this paper is 200 points on your grade. And so verb, now. I know the difference is the plural, women and woman. Avoid shifting tenses. This is another one that comes up quite frequently. There might be some cases where you would shift the verb tense in your paper between present and past. But in general, you should keep all of your verbs in the past tense or all of your verbs in the present tense. Now, if you're writing a history paper, all of it should be in the past. But there might be a reason why you would want to put things in the present but try to avoid switching back and forth. And so in this case, I would say, ignore the Gospel of John's approach to this. Because John will go from present to past very indiscriminately. Right? Uh, if you actually read that, like say, in a older translation that tries to keep the verb tense as the verb tense in the Greek, you'll be reading along in the past, and then all of a sudden John will switch to the present. If John was inspired, he can do it, you are not. So keep it all in the past, or keep it all in the present. Um, try to avoid that back and forth. So I guess you had a podcast about who read one of your articles or one of your sources who had like passed away. You did like he believes that this is this, and then like, the next person was still alive. So he believes. In that case, since everything has been written in the past, you could just all keep it in the past, even though your author may or may not be still alive. Now, certainly one thing to do, and that kind of reminds me of something, if your source is in the present tense and you are quoting directly from your source, quote exactly as it is in the source. Right? If you decided I'm going to write everything in the past tense, if you are quoting from your source and they use the present tense, then use the present tense if you're quoting. Right? So that doesn't apply to I'm quoting this from somebody else. Other questions? A couple last things, things we've uh, talked about already. Whether you're using it in, the, in, in your paper or in a footnote, titles of books and journals should be italics or underlined. Titles of journal articles, however, should be in quotation marks. Books of the Bible, however, should not be italicized. Right? So if you're right, you know, if you're writing Matthew. 28, 19 through 20. You don't italicize Matthew. Keep Matthew in the standard form. Certainly there are other things that we could probably talk about, but these are ones that I've highlighted because these seem to be ones that show up frequently. Um, again, often because there is that uh, either there homophones, right, they sound alike, and so in the brain they kind of, uh, you might write them the word wrong way, or they uh, are easy to overlook, or are standard 
problems that show up in papers. Any questions? Good. If we have an, um, a source and it quotes another source, but we want to use that quote that they quoted, how do you use In general, if it's something like that, you should try to find the source that has been quoted. Right? And so that you're, because um, if you're using a source, using a source to quote somebody else, they could be misrepresenting what was originally said. It's unlikely, but they could be. It, it has happened. And probably accidentally. If, however, you can't find that source, you know, it's like, okay, it's this obscure book and it would never get here in time, and those kind of things then you could say, quoted in, and then put the source that you're looking for. Um, you know, and so that would be the way to handle that. Um, but if at all possible, get that source that you, you know, I, I like this quote better than what this other person said. So try to get that source. <laughs> other questions? All right. Uh, if not, we'll end there for today, a little bit early. Um, and on Wednesday, we'll pick up with pitfalls. Don't forget, before you leave, to have signed up for one of the presentation slots for next Monday or next Wednesday.